no once again. So we have um, we have come to the conclusion of the main presentations, which are more like frameworks. So the next section we tagged it panel of case studies. Essentially, we want to we want to listen to specific stories. Some of the stories you might wonder what's the connection between this story and this. Like one of the stories is a unique case of justice delivery. Justice delivery is one of the SDGs. And then the question is what has intellectual property got to do with this? Now we have heard that intellectual property um, connects with um, creativity and innovation. And most of this uh, knowledge, creativity and innovation, they are what helps a lot of the problems in life, health issues, food, guarantee food, safety, and things like that, um, livelihood. So um, at these case studies now, listen to their unique stories. We have six case studies. I'm hoping that um, we we'll have all of them able to present. Three are going to be speaking here with us. Three are going to be speaking offline. So I will urge the IT people to put their profile one by one. I want to start with um, I want to start with Alafia. Alafia, I think you're the first person on our panel. So, I'm not going to mind, just have a seat here, please. Please? Yeah, thank you. So, the next person, I'll say the next story is um, Olu Kusola um, Afolabi. Are you here? Okay, yes. Thank you. And we also have joining us all the way from Netherlands, we have Dr. Douglas McCarthy. I don't know if it, okay, before I get to um, Douglas, let me call the next person to join physically here. And um, I'm speaking of no other than Ms. Linda Arfez. Arfez. So, Ms. Linda, you're welcome. Can you put up your profile on the so Linda is a director with the Nigerian Copyright Commission, Lagos Office. And then um, Olu is from the Free Knowledge Africa, also in charge of research, education research, right? Okay, that's you. Okay, we have um, Alafia, who is a co-founder of Free Knowledge Africa. So Alafia is going to tell us his story about um, open domain and projects that they have done about open domain and how they have some kind of connection with the SDG. And Olu Kisola is going to be talking to us about Creative Commons licenses. While Linda is going to be talking to us about partnerships, how you can also um, build partnerships and that way you help the attainment of the SDGs. So that is for the people we have here. So we have our online panelists. Um, I think I called Dr. Douglas earlier. I don't know if he's here with us. Dr. Do Douglas, are you there? He's here, okay. Dr. Douglas, you're welcome. So Douglas has a unique story to tell us about the, the project they call Open Land Survey and how that project helps the access to information and knowledge, especially in cultural institutions like libraries. And we have a very good library here. It's an interesting conversation for our librarian here. So um, we also have online Ms. Esther Ngom. Esther, are you here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Esther, are you here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Esther, Esther, you're welcome. So Esther is going to tell us about geographical indications and how it has, uh, it has the potential of helping rural development. 
in Cameroon. And then last but not the least, we have our very own Honorable Comfort Chinyere Ami. I'm hoping that she'll be able to join us along the line. Presently, she said she's on board. She's on air. So if we cannot really connect to her, I hope that we'll be able to connect with her as soon as she can. So that's it for the panel that we have. So I'll go straight on with you, Douglas. And let me remind all the panel we have 10 minutes. You have 10 minutes to tell us a story. Sorry, sorry, not Douglas. Sorry about that. Alafia. Alafia, we have you on the as a first panelist, right? So let us hear your story. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon from Nigeria, for those joining us online. This is Alafia Abani, um, part of the leadership of Free Knowledge Africa. And in 2021, we, the leaders of Free Knowledge Africa, discovered the importance of the public domain through the works of the members of the Creative Commons, uh, national, the Creative Commons group in Indonesia, led by Ima, Ima Fatoni at that time. Our, sorry, our interest, our interest was picked and we were, we were interested in the purpose of the public domain and we started this public domain digitalization project. So our first step was to identify the works in the public domain. We decided to to carry out a contest where we invited multiple young Nigerians. We before the contest we did an educational video about what works in, what what are the works in the public domain, how to identify them. For instance, books expire seven the copyright of books expire seventy years after the death of the author. So we made an interesting video, we made it available on social media. It is currently on our, on our YouTube and we, we carried out the contest. And in that contest, we were able to document over 1,000 books, oh, sorry, over 1,000 creative works in the public domain. So when we realized the, the voluminous nature of works just through, through, online, through an online um, survey, we thought about digitizing this work then last year we, we embarked on this journey on this on this journey that, that is not going to end soon on about what is in the public domain about books in the public domain in nigeria and informing librarians about this procedure so last year we started from the department of library services at the national library abuja and we went to a, when we went there we advocated about the public domain we educated the librarians in that department we had a, we had a session with them and in that procedure we were able to we were able to get about 400 works digitized those works are currently on those works are currently on wikimedia commons and in the future we we, we, we expand we plan on expanding it through the or through this website called publicdomain.ng. So publicdomain.ng will be like an online repository of all public domain works, all digitized public domain works. It is we, we just got the the, the 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 name. We've not built the website yet, but it is it is a work in progress. So we need so this this procedure is very very important, and we need to educate more Nigerians about it. So the first step is we want to we want to encourage our librarians, our creative authors that it is not all your creative work you you get your copyright on. Some can be released into the public domain as it as its advantages and its as its as its, as its disadvantages. Well one the colour is one the solar is speaking, she's going to mention the, the essence of releasing works into the open movement. So I don't want to get into that. And as it relates to the SDGs, releasing education, open educational resources into the public domain 
and can help us solve the issue of we have this problem in Nigeria where we have about I think 15 to 20 million kids are out of school. So, so if we can use open educational resources, we can have class data banks in different region of different region of Nigeria, and children can go to school at their own free will. The, 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 the concept of education can be does not have to be based does not have to be based on the classroom. We can remodel this 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 concept of education and have class monitors or have class data banks and through the internet educate the 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 regions of Nigeria where, where there are no schools and open educational resources give us these opportunities and documenting items into the public domain also give us this opportunity where anybody in, in the whole in the whole world can use your resources. So that is what I want to say for now. And if if there are questions I would like to improve on it. Thank you. Thank you. Can do better. I know we are tired. Thank you. Um, I love you. Thank you very much for that uh, brief of explanation of your own experience. Now, Mr. Lack, can we hear from you about creative commons? Thank you. Good day, everybody. I'm here as a member of the United Act team and also as a member of Creative Commons Government and Creative Commons Nigeria. Now, a lot of people have spoken about IPD and the public domain, and though what is more prevalent to us in IP is copyright. So, we have copyright, we have um, public domain, which are like on opposite ends of like a line because public domain is simply saying so there are no rights reserved, like everybody uses your rights, and copyright is all rights reserved. The author owns total um, rights to his or her But then there's another concept of some rights reserved. So it doesn't have to be totally closed or totally open. It could be in between, and that's where creative common licenses come. And there is a series of licenses that gives authors the right to release their work on certain conditions. Your work when you use copyright to release your work, you are, you are um, taking total control to yourself, like right? all rights are reserved to you as the author. And when you release your work under the public domain, you are releasing total rights, meaning no rights reserved to you. Everybody can use uh, your work as they see fit. But then you are, you are um, creating formal licenses that kind of bridge the gap between public domain and copyright. So people refer to public domain as copyright. Just to show you, one is at the left hand side, one is at the right hand side, and then we have pretty common licenses in between. So I'll just um, give a rundown on these licenses. There are six in number. So the first one is CC BY. That's CC stands for Creative Commons. So BY yes stands for attribution. Now attribution simply says you have to credit me as the owner of this work. You know, it's public domain. You don't even have to credit me. You know what that in public domain it belongs to nobody, so you could use it as you see fit. But once I publish my work on that CC BY, it means you could use the work as you see fit, and you'll just credit me as the original author to that CC BY, which is the um, least, uh, is like the least, um, least strict, the least strict license. So it's closer to public domain than copyright, the CC BY. Then the second one is CC BY SA. Okay, um, the buy there is a constant on all six creative common licenses. So for whatever creative common license you choose to use, attribution is a constant. So attribution is always there. So the second one is now CC by SA, which is attribution share alike. Now share alike comes in the in fact that if I am with If you use my work, you can come and copyright that work. So it's just for like a continuity to bring about a continuity of the creative common license. So when I share my work on that CC by SA, number one, you have to attribute me, and number two, you have to share your work in like or similar manner by which I shared my work. Now the third one is CC by MC, which is non-commercial. Remember, I said by is a constant, so I'm saying by for every license. Now, NC is non-commercial, meaning you can use my work, you have to attribute me, which is by, which is a constant. 
The moment you use my work and you sell the printing of my rights, even though I go to me, even though I release that work openly, but then there are some conditions you have to um, go through, there are some conditions you have to fulfill while using my work. So CC by MC is non-commercial. You can only use the work for non-commercial purposes, like creating uh, for research purposes, for creating open educational resources for teaching or for schools or for um, anything that is a uh, non-commercial purpose. Now the first one is CC by ND. ND says non-derivative, meaning you can't change anything about my work. Now if I release a work and I wrote a book in Yoruba language, once you are using my work, you have to use it in Yoruba language. The moment you translate it to English, you have infringed on my copyright. If I have a painting and I did a painting of a dog, and then you want to use, but you want to put that painting on your t-shirt, the moment you, I painted the dog purple color, the moment you change the color of that dog, you've infringed on my copyright. So those are, that's the conditions to not do it. If you have to use it exactly as it is, the moment you change something about it, you have infringed on my copyright. But if you use it as it is, uh, it's open because I release it openly on that CC by and D. To, uh, just to remind everyone that buy is a constant. You have to attribute me for every every word you use under pretty common license. You have to attribute the original owner. Now the fifth license is a combination of two licenses. That's um, CC by NCSA, which is non-commercial share alike. Meaning you can use my work. You have to share it in. My colleague Dr. Andrea Wallace, who spoke earlier today, and I, and some fellow members of the Open Globe community realised that we needed a shared document, a resource that tracks the recorded how GLAMs make open access data, digital objects, metadata or text available for reuse. So in 2018, six years ago, the Open Glam survey was born. There is a link to it here, but in essence, the Open Glam survey is at its core a large larger than before, a Google sheet, a spreadsheet, which records in a lot of detail which institutions are practicing open GLAD policies and how they are doing them. We created the survey to address a fundamental information gap. There was a lack of comprehensive and up-to-date information about open access in GLAM. There was no shared place to see or to add relevant data and we were very motivated to discover and to share the global picture with colleagues, friends, uh, fellow researchers and others. And we really helped people who were researching open access policy and practice in the GLAM sector. And also to help people who wanted to find and use open content or data. How do we do this? Well. the desk research, so visiting museum, library, archive websites, sharing through word of mouth, maybe on Twitter or on LinkedIn or email, knowledge and new open institutions uh, with the global brand community. So many people are like us today at this event who let us know and we add those institutions if they qualify to the open plan survey. The focus of the data in the survey is content digital content that GLAMs make available on their own websites and or external websites or other platforms. And the focus is on digital surrogates of objects in the public domain, where any term of copyright in the material object, let's say an old photograph or a map or a painting, the copyright has expired or it never existed in the first place. The survey has many data points, more than we have time today to look at, but the key ones are as follows. The institution name is presented in its original language, so in French for a French institution, and also in English. We show the country and the type of institution. Is it a university library? Is it an archive? Is it a gallery? And we provide, through the survey, direct links to all of the open content and data including GitHub's APIs. And for the intellectual property and copyright fans, which is most of us today, 
we provide detailed information on which open licenses or rights statements are being used for the digital surrogates and or the metadata. We link to the terms of use and copyright policies of every institution and the survey is also annotated in detail in Wikidata. Every institution in the survey has a Wikidata QID for it. So over six years, the survey has grown in number and complexity. Back in March 2018, when we started, we had just over 30 institutions. Now we have 1,668, I think is the current figure. So the growth and the, the reach of the survey has really developed in, in those years. If we look at Open Plan today, one of the nice things about the survey is because it's in a spreadsheet, it's completely open for anyone to access that and to reuse it. And because it's in Wikidata, it's easy to generate visualization of copyright and licensing and things like this nice map, which is made through a Wikidata Sparkle query that shows where open plan institutions are distributed all around the world. Now, if we zoom in slightly and we look at Africa, we see that open plan, according to the survey, as much as I know at the moment, is uh, yet it still remains a big opportunity for Africa and African institutions to, uh, to, to become part of the open plan movement. But is this picture accurate? Are there institutions who are open access, maybe published open content to Wikimedia Commons or on their own websites that we don't know about yet? Quite possibly, probably, and I really hope so. So if you all today know of an institution that you think qualifies, and we are missing, I would absolutely love to hear from you, so please get in touch. To access the survey directly and in Wikidata, I've posted some links here and the link to these slides will be shared. And I've also written and uh, analysed and provided insight into the survey and what it tells us in a lot more detail on my website, douglasmccarthy.com. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Please feel free to contact me, connect on LinkedIn, through my website, or on Twitter, at CultureDoug, and thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Douglas, for providing so much information about your project. And um, I'm, I'm sure that we will definitely connect with you to learn more and see how we can also benefit from that. Also, I think this particular speaker can connect indirectly to um, Professor Yemi, um, Professor Lawal's presentation on traditional knowledge. But it's not traditional knowledge in the cultural context that she presented. This is more about agricultural knowledge. And um, I'm talking about geographical indication. We have a very good example. Unfortunately, Nigeria doesn't have the law protecting geographical indication. But we have a very good example we can learn from Cameroon. And the person to tell us more about that is um, Ms. Esther Ngo. Esther is the legal cons consultant is in Yaoundé, but she also um, works with the OAP institution, so she's also well connected within the OAP jurisdiction. So Esther, if you can hear me, please, you can proceed. <laughs> Esther? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Esther. Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Esther. Okay, thank you, Helen. Thank you for the organization for inviting me. I'll share my screen. Can you see the screen? Uh, not yet. I 
guess it's still loading. Okay, we can see your screen now. Okay, so the, uh, as I was saying, I want to thank first the organization and particularly for inviting me to join you that very of the World Intention University. And uh, I've been asked to, to talk about um, an IP asset that is not well known in Africa, although we have very huge potential of it, uh, geographical education that apply into agricultural and handicrafts. So I I'll just I'll just change a little bit the the, the, the title to extend from Cameroon to OAPI, which is the African Intellectual Property Organization that has 17 member states from West and Central Africa and West Comoros Island, and that has uh, one law. So we have the Bank of you know, uh, Bamako Act and uh, one law that is the IP law for all the states, one IP office. So, what is the, the office that is for all the different universities with a local office, kind of years office in each of the countries, Head, headquarters, you know, one procedure for all the, all the IP assets. So it's a single system like this in the world. Other, the other system we have a regional body plus the, the national the national legislature. So I, I want to extend to OAP to see all the other other uh, geographic education that have been registered until now. And uh, that's that's what we, we see. And how they cope with uh, the SDG, we, we think about the SDG 1, no poverty, no poverty. SDG 8, which is having, having um, decent work and economic growth. And some of the, some of the, um, some of the SDG. So we see the later framework very quickly because it's a particular IP asset that people does not know or are not used to. So in the in the core families, there are elements on the data framework, the concepts and the relationship between GIS and other IP, IP projects, the legal protection mechanism. And in the second uh, phase we see the registration procedure for, for, for those first local GIS to be registered in one pay space. And then the evolution of what pay of the GI framework and, and all um, GI protection is a tool for Africa's development to meet those SDG. So I will not stay a lot because of time or spend on the legal aspect of just stay one more on it and then we'll be able to bring this in detail after the organization share the looking at. We all know the agilities of the wine, the beef, uh, Jamaican mountain, tequila, and so on, that are popular uh, geographic education. GIs have, are also always associated to many products linked with history and culture of particular uh, geographical area. And that, then they are very highly lucrative uh, assets, worth millions of dollars, and they are popular at the national, regional, and international level, and are always associated to some trademarks. But we know GIs, and we don't know sometimes what is their utility. GIs is an education used to identify a product as originating from the limited territory or region, where a given quality, reputation, or other characteristic of the product can be attributed essentially to that geographical region and or to the natural or human factors present there. So when we have talked about GIS when we have a product, we have an origin, a territory or region, we have specific characteristics of the product or reputation, and we have um, the link between that characteristic, those characteristics or reputation with the geographical origin and natural human factors that are only present on that place. This is how we know we have a 
GI. GI are detected in a variety of ways. Um, so first, under the official GI system, GI uh, as trade marks, certification mark or collective trade marks. In African countries, we have several that in practice are used as GI. For Nigeria, for example, for the Suka, the yellow paper, or the Ejebu Gari. We have the Gali Violet Onion, which is a protected GI from Nigeria. We have the Corobo clothes from Cote d'Ivoire, and so on. In the world, we have approximately 10,000 GIs that are protected, but almost 90% of them are found in uh, European countries, with uh, the rest of 160 countries that does not really apply um, GIs. According to a study from the European Commission in 2020, uh, which is the economic value of ethnic, quality chain, GIs, and traditional social security property, every food and drink products would be moved by GIs. I'm talking about partnership of unit strong institutions for the SDGs. So I will attempt to define partnership. Partnership is a contract between two or more competent people who agree to put in their resources, their money, their labor, their skill into a lawful enterprise with the understanding that uh, the profits and the losses will be shared in a proportional way. I think I got that from uh, Black's Law Dictionary, so I'm not claiming copyright for that. So if you take a look at the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted by the United Nations in 2015, um, it's, a call of, it's a call to action to the whole world to put an end to poverty, to protect the earth, and with the intention that by the year 2030, every part of the world, everybody would enjoy uh, prosperity, peace and prosperity. So there are 17 of them. The 17th one talks about partnership for the SDG. So the 17th one is like a convener, a facilitator to the rest. It is like this four finger. You know, your four finger runs through the whole fingers. So the 17th SDG goal that talks about partnership runs through the rest of the SDG goals. Without partnership, you cannot achieve any of the rest. Without partnership, you cannot achieve, uh, 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 put an end to poverty. You cannot achieve a, 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 a improving industry, creativity, innovation, and all that. So the SDG 17 is what we are actually talking about. So the SDG 17 is very important to the others. Now I'm going to use Nigerian Copyright Commission as a case study for uh, uh, partnership and collaboration. How we have used partnership and collaboration to achieve our goals. You know, we say partnership and building strong institutions to achieve the SDG goal. Institutions are organizations, foundations that are set up to achieve a particular goal. So how do you build a use partnership to achieve your goal? That's what we are talking about now. This is my organization, Nigerian Copyright Commission, as a case study. The Nigerian Copyright Commission is a federal government agency charged with the administration, regulation, and enforcement of copyright in Nigeria. So for us to administer, enforce, and regulate copyright, we must protect creativity. In fact, that is our mandate, to protect creativity. And if we must protect creativity, we must deal with the enemy of creativity. We know that the greatest enemy of creativity is piracy, which is the commercial utilization of copyright works without the authorization of the copyright owner. Now we must check piracy. We must make sure that piracy is reduced to the barest minimum in order to encourage creatives to continue creating. One of the ways we can do that is to go to places where pirated materials are being sold or made available to the public and try to check them. Now, Nigeria Copyright Commission is not an uncarried agency. So, and we must go into the market. For example, let me just give an example. I'm not saying that's the only place or the place where they sell pirated works. I'm just saying. For example, you go to Adaba market. You can imagine me with my lightweight and a couple of these my colleagues here. And we step into Adaba market and we say, oh, we have come here to arrest all those who are selling pirated materials. What do you think will happen? They will beat us black and blue. And by the time we come out there, we will not be able to recognize us. So in order to solve that, we have to go with the Nigerian police. We have to enter into an agreement, a collaboration with the Nigerian police that every time we, every time we need to enter into a place where they are selling pirated material or we need to do anti-piracy actions, 
the police will accompany us. So that is collaboration. So every time we have to go to another market, to go to Argentina, to go to all those places, I'm not saying this, people are the only places. We go with the Nigerian police. I'm sure if you, my colleagues have opportunity, one or two of them will tell you their stories of how they have had to jump fence sometimes to run away from the market to run for their lives. It's not a very easy one. So we must go with an, an armed carrying agency. So we have the collaboration with the Nigerian police for that. Now, for us to check piracy also, we must check piracy at the point of entry. That is the ports and the borders. And Nigerian Copyright Commission is not one of the federal government agencies that stay in the ports. We don't have any position in the port. So how do we handle that? We have to enter into an MOU in collaboration with the Nigerian Customs Service that they will watch out for any copyrighted material. So we have an MOU with the Customs right now that before any copyrighted material is released from the port, they must have a letter of authorization from us. So the people that are bringing in such pirated materials will come to our office, invite us, we go and do an inspection of what they are bringing in and give them a letter of clearance that these are not pirated materials before the customs will release it. That is collaboration. We use that to solve that problem. Now, we also get privileged information. They get intel. They know how, when some of these pirated materials are being brought in. They know when some of them are being produced. So we have a collaboration with them. They give us information when such things are coming up. And they also are the port. So they are watching out at the port for people who are bringing in uh, copyrighted materials. They are looking out for what they are bringing in. So, and when there is any such intel, they inform us and go to the port to make sure that if there is a pirated material, it is seized immediately and people possibly arrested. So we have collaboration with the ESS. Now we have collaboration with NICE. That's why we are here. We know that NICE was set up for quality research and we know they do a lot of seminars and enlightenment. One of our mandates as a commission is to enlighten people about copyright. You know, one of the great, uh, one of the, I don't know if I said the greatest, but one of the problems of copyright is literacy. A lot of people do not understand copyright, do not understand the workings of copyright, including the right owners themselves. So we look for opportunity to go out and enlighten people. That is why we are here today. That we have to them to collaborate with them so that we can come here and tell you about copyright and tell you how to protect your work if you are a copyright owner. Those are government agencies. Okay. Those are government agencies. Now, we are aware that the Nigerian uh, Copyright Act, uh, there's a new Copyright Act, which was signed in total in March 2023. It's still very new. And this Copyright Act has aligned itself with the world's best practices. For the first time, the Copyright Act has made uh, provision for online enforcement of copyright laws. I'm sure we are all aware that the, the online space. <laughs> online enforcement of copyright. One of the provisions there says that the Nigerian Copyright Commission can take down or block access to any material that is suspect, reasonably suspect to be carrying pirated books. By our trainings, we may not be able to do this. So we have to collaborate with agencies that are tech savvy, agencies that can help us. We collaborate with uh, NIRA, for example, Niger um, Nigerian Internet Registration uh, Services. We collaborate with service providers for this. We collaborate with uh, NITDA. Nigerian Information Technological Development Agencies. These agencies are the agencies we need for us to be able to take down. We need that technology to know how to go about it. We are in the process of uh, enforcing this uh, new copyright act, making sure, like my DG said in the morning, that every aspect of the copyright act is implemented. We need people that will help us. We need capacity building. One of the people we collaborate with is WIPO. WIPO helps us with uh, capacity building. They furnish us with two kits that we can use to make sure that we do our work effectively. So these areas we collaborate so that we can make sure that we do our work effectively. We also collaborate with publishers association. We have meetings, we have, we have uh, uh, an agreement with publishers association. And so, that is my surprise. We also have agreement with booksellers because those are the people that sell, not all of them, some of them sell pirated materials. So we have to enter into agreement with some of their leaders that these people should 
go and deal with publishers. Rather than uh, sending pirated materials, we had a meeting with this community. We project together with publishers. We try to make arrangements for publishers to supply them directly so that they cannot they will stop one minimize the set of pirated These are the areas where we both the public and the private sector in order to In most African countries, we find that um, uh, the foreign companies came with their own branches here, develop it, and ultimately Nigerians, Ghanaians, and Somebody may have it and now it becomes something that they will set to us again. 
supply her the chips that they produce. Or to give her exclusive, you know, make it exclusive to her to be their representative. There's really nothing anybody can do to that. Do you understand? So in IP we also have what you call exclusive licensing and non-exclusive licensing and stuff like that. So it's left to the suppliers if there's an agreement between them and all that. For instance, you have KFC franchise, you understand? You have things like that. You know, they might decide to allow more than one person to run KFC, but the real owners are over there. It is their choice if they're the ones given to that person and stuff like that. But if there's any chips, not this stuff that anybody from, if somebody gets chips from any other place, you can sell your chips. She doesn't, but if, they, if she gets her own from a particular distributor and there's an agreement between them that that is how the owner wants it to be done, then there's hardly anything you can do about that. Because I can see you are very passionate about that issue. You don't like the idea. <laughs> Thank you so much. Suppliers, must she be the only one supplying it? If there's something special about that, that the, the chips, then it's a challenge to other people to find out how they can make their own chips better. And they flood the market with their own chips, and everybody will abandon her own. So people should be thinking outside the box. So I have a question earlier, Miss. Ngozi Adiribibe, she, she spoke about, about intellectual property as it relates to the creative sector. So I wanted to ask our learned, I want to ask our, our learned colleagues here, is there a room in the provision, in the, in the Nigerian Copyright Law of 2023 as enacted, is there a room permitting institutions to recopyright works that enter into the public domain and if, if, if there is no permission to that, what can organizations like Free Knowledge Africa do to, to prevent such from happening? Also, Madam Linda here mentioned that the NCC is looking forward to partner, partner with multiple organizations. She said a lot about partnerships. I want to know what are the procedures to the organizations like Free Knowledge Africa have to take to partner with the NCC and is the NCC willing to partner with Free Knowledge Africa? Those are my questions. Thank you very much for your questions. Let me take the first one as much as a bit, a bit I can take. Uh, your, the question has to do with, can somebody recopyright something that has gone into the public domain? What copyright does is that copyright protects your expression of your idea. So if a work has gone into the public domain, for example, and you take that work and recreate it something, somehow, you add to it, you have created your own copyright work. So the copyright now protects that your work. It's, it's, it, even if you um, infringe on somebody's copyright, you take somebody's copyright, you infringe on it, and create a new work. Despite the fact that your work was born out of an infringing uh, work, it still enjoys its own copyright because it is a work. It has been expressed in a medium capable of being perceived. So if people take, for example, the story of Shakespeare and rewrite it in their own way, because it's in the public domain, they have a right to take it. They can rewrite it, add a few things to it. It's, it now enjoys copyright altogether because something has been added. They have made some effort to, uh, to make the work unique. They have expressed it in their own original way. So that work enjoys copyright. But not that you will take something from the public domain, you did not add anything, and you say, I don't even know how you want to begin to recopyright it if there's any sort of work. So I think that's, that answered that question. Then how can Nigerian Copyright Co Commission collaborate with uh, other agencies? If you have ideas that, we can, that, can, that is workable with our mandate, please come to us. You don't need any formality. For example, we are here now. We, they didn't need to write us a letter to be here. So if you have something that falls within our mandate, we'll be ready to partner with you. Because I know you are very passionate about the public domain. There's no problem. Let me just use the book. Let's say Professor Wally Shoyinka, which you insist is doing a lot about his book. I love this book, Lion and the Jewel. It's lifetime of author. The 70 years, isn't it? You, you'll be old by the time that thing is ready to fall into the public domain. 
<laughs> You'll be so old. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Because you are doing a good thing. NCC must partner with you because we need to digitize a whole lot of things that are out there. So you go to NCC and all that. You are doing a great work if this is what you're doing. Again, apart from just this copyrighted works and all that, there are a whole lot of indigenous stuff that are out there that we don't even digitize, which are peculiar to Nigeria. So digitization is actually important and key um, to the things that we're doing and all that. But as long as someone has copyright protection, you cannot, unless, like you said, it's an adaptation. So it's Lion and the Jaw, but you're not calling Lion and the Jaw. You understand? It's another thing. But anybody looking at you say, like Cinderella, you have like 50 versions of Cinderella. You understand? But when it gets to the public domain, it takes a long time. What will be in the public domain now will be things that, you understand, had protection a long time ago and they're there now and then you can use as you want. And then, I was going to mention moral rights. I don't know how many of us, we don't talk about moral rights, you know, distribution and stuff like that, even if it's in the public domain. Like that, but things like piracy and stuff like that kills uh, um, the trying works as you go along. So, yes, what's in the public domain, you can't use, but it takes a long time, before get, especially for copyright to get into the public domain. But there's so many things in existence that needs to be digital, uh, digitized and digitalized and stuff like that. But it's very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the reason why I mentioned that is that there's a case in, in, the, in the, where glam institutions well, which refers to galleries, libraries, archives, and monuments, they are recopyrighting works that have entered into the public domain. So I want to like, I, I ask the question to equip all of us here to, to cause an awareness that when, when we realize that works are in the public domain and we see other institutions uh, uh, recopyrighting them, maybe through digitization and like, imagine they digitize, they digitize this, or those Benin bronze, and they call it their copyright. Those Benin bronze are in the public domain already because the creative work has been done in the 16th centuries. So those, those are the things I want us to educate the general public.